Hello, my name is Robert Haddad, and today I'll be speaking to you about the joy of the Immaculate Conception of Mary. What is the Immaculate Conception, and why is it joyful? The Immaculate Conception relates to the creation and birth of the Blessed Virgin Mary, free from all stain of original sin. It was solemnly defined by Blessed Pius IX on the 8th of December 1854 as follows. The Most Blessed Virgin Mary was, from the first moment of her conception, by a singular grace and privilege of Almighty God, and by virtue of the merits of Jesus Christ, Saviour of the human race, preserved immune from all stain of original sin. And this was contained in the Pope's bull in Ephibilis Deus on the 8th of December, 1854. What does this definition mean precisely? That the Blessed Virgin Mary was conceived and born not only in grace, but free from all the stains, all the effects and all the consequences of original sin. In other words, she was created like our mother Eve, free from all sin. And hence, by being created free from all sin herself, Mary became our new mother, the mother of the church, the new Eve. Why the Immaculate Conception? Firstly, to circumvent the victory that Lucifer achieved over humanity through the original sin. In the, according to certain scholars, the original test put to Lucifer and the angels for them to enter into heavenly glory, God showed them his future plan to create Adam and Eve as a prelude to the incarnation, that is, God becoming man and dwelling among humanity. And in this plan of God, God was going to elevate this God-man and his mother to be king and queen of heaven. And Lucifer and the angels were asked to conform their wills to this plan of God. Of course, we know Lucifer and one third of the angels said no. They said, they declared better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. When Lucifer saw the creation of Adam and Eve, he saw the first steps in God's plan up for the incarnation. This is why he attacked and he succeeded in this attack, getting, getting Adam and Eve under his dominion, ripping them out of the grace of God. And in doing so, he believed he achieved this great victory and frustrated God's plan for the incarnation. But God would circumvent Lucifer's victory. And how did he do this? Through the Immaculate Conception, creating Mary as the new Eve, free from all stain of original sin, so that the incarnation could eventually take place. Also, we have arguments from appropriateness. When we look at the creation of Adam, he was brought forth from the pure and sin sinless earth. Likewise, the new Adam, Jesus Christ, would be brought forth from a pure and sinless womb, namely Mary's womb. Also, we have another argument from appropriateness. It was not appropriate that God's dwelling place on earth, the womb of the Virgin Mary, would in any way be under the influence or dominion of Lucifer. It would be God's house and it would be God's house completely. So this house would be free from all sin, all stain of sin and all the influence of Lucifer. God's house, in other words, would not be mortgaged to the devil. This is why the Immaculate Conception took place. It was also inappropriate that the daughter, mother and spouse of God would be in any way, shape or form under the dominion of Lucifer. Some argue that the Immaculate Conception of Mary is unscriptural. If Mary was conceived and born without sin, then she wouldn't have needed a Redeemer. Yet St. Paul says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All must include Mary. If Mary is not within the all, then she did not need redemption. Jesus wouldn't be her saviour. 
Is this the case? Not so. Mary, as a daughter of Adam, required redemption as well. But her mode of redemption will be more perfect. We're redeemed, we're saved by sin through the cross of Christ. We have caught original sin and then were cured of it, beginning with baptism. Mary was also saved from original sin, saved by Jesus Christ. This is salvation, redemption by preemption. The merits of Jesus Christ, the merits he won for us on the cross, was applied in advance to Mary. So that rather than being saved after catching original sin, Mary was redeemed in a more perfect manner. In a sense, she was inoculated against original sin at the moment of her creation. So, hence again the term redemption by preemption. Mary was saved, just in a more perfect mode. Another reason for the Immaculate Conception uh, was a problem foreseen by the scholastics of the Middle Ages. If Mary had original sin, then how could she conceive and bear Jesus, bring forth Jesus in the world, without Jesus contracting original sin himself? How could Jesus be the redeemer of humanity if he himself had original sin? How could he be the spotless lamb, offering to the Father that perfect sacrifice for sin on our behalf if he contracted original sin? Well, there's two solutions to this problem. God could have intervened at the moment of the conception of Jesus and Mary's womb at the incarnation. Or God could uh, intervene one generation early at the conception of Mary in her mother's womb. It was more appropriate to intervene at that earlier stage, at Mary's conception. Why? Because the Immaculate Conception is essentially an act of redemption, is how Mary was redeemed. To intervene at the conception of Christ in Mary's womb would have meant that the Redeemer himself required redemption. It's inappropriate that the Redeemer would, be necess would necessarily require redemption. Hence, the act would occur one generation earlier, when Mary was conceived in her mother's womb, her mother being named Anne, Anna by tradition. Now, by being conceived uh, without original sin, therefore Mary could pass on an unwounded, perfect human nature to the Redeemer, and Jesus could be our perfect sacrifice on our behalf. We've heard of one scriptural argument against the Immaculate Conception. What are the scriptural supports for the Immaculate Conception? Let's go back to the book of Genesis, chapter 3. We read in that chapter the terrible event of the fall of humanity. As we said earlier, Lucifer targeted Adam and Eve in order to rip them out of the dominion and grace of God and place them under his own dominion. He won a great victory then. And thinking at the same time that he's thwarted God's plan for the incarnation. But... We read in the same chapter, immediately after the fall of Adam and Eve, God pronounced a sentence against Lucifer. Chapter 3, verse 15 of the book of Genesis. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. These mysterious words. What is this enmity? Who is this woman? Was there an enmity placed between Lucifer and Eve? We know not such an enmity. At this point, Eve is under the dominion of Lucifer. God is speaking about an event in the future. The event of the promised Redeemer and the salvation of humanity from sin. This will begin by God freely choosing graciously to intervene and to be, create a new Eve who bring forth the new Adam and redeem humanity. This enmity that God places between Lucifer and the woman is the Immaculate Conception. Lucifer has dominion over Adam and Eve and all their children. 
but there'll be one future child of Adam over which Lucifer will have no dominion. And that would be Mary, the mother of the Redeemer. Uh, and, and as a consequence, God's plan for redemption of humanity will be able to be rolled out. Where's the evidence that God actually placed this enmity and placed it in Mary against Lucifer? The evidence in, is found in the Gospel of Luke. Luke 1 verse 28, when the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and announced the following, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. This term, full of grace, we notice that the angel Gabriel did not refer to Mary by her first name. The angel Gabriel did not say, Hail Mary, but said, Hail thou art graced. The Greek word, kekaratomene, the, the core, the root of that word, charis, means grace. And those who are experts in the Greek language tell us that this word, kekaratomene, is a past perfect participle. What does that mean? It means it's a word that relates to something that happened in the past, that was completed in the past, but remains in the present. What happened in the past with relation to Mary? She was conceived free from all sin. That is a habitual condition in Mary. That remains in Mary as complete, and it's still the case when the angel Gabriel appeared to her and announced to her that she was going to be the mother of the Messiah. Hail thou who art graced. This Mary was placed in grace from the moment of her conception. This was the enmity that God placed between Lucifer and and the woman. Mary now is the woman. We know she is the woman. Jesus refers to her as the woman at, his, at the performance of his first miracle at the wedding of Cana. Woman, what, ha, what has this got to do with you and me? Then later on the cross, Jesus again refers to his mother. Woman, behold thy son. Son, behold thy mother. So Mary is this mysterious woman of Genesis 3. She has received this enmity. By being placed in grace from the moment of her conception, she's at enmity with Lucifer, at war with Lucifer. Lucifer has no dominion over her. This is what would infuriate Lucifer because he cannot stop this. The, we have precedence also in other examples when we look at the Old Testament and the New Testament where God intervenes to free human beings from sin. We see it with firstly the prophet Jeremiah. He is born free from sin, not conceived without sin, but he was purified in his mother's womb as a preparation for his great and prophetic mission. The prophet Jeremiah being most of all the prophets, most like Jesus in his sufferings. We see it again at the beginning of the New Testament era with respect to John the Baptist, the last and the greatest prophets of the Old Testament. When the Virgin Mary visits Ein Karim to visit her kinswoman, St. Elizabeth, knowing now that she's six months pregnant with this future prophet. When the Virgin Mary arrives and knocks at the door of St. Elizabeth, and St. Elizabeth hears this, she's filled with the Holy Spirit, and the child in her womb leapt for joy. John the Baptist rejoiced. The, the child in the womb of St. Elizabeth rejoiced when he became aware of the presence of Jesus the Messiah in the womb of the Virgin Mary, when he heard Mary's voice. At that moment, John the Baptist too was purified from sin in his mother's womb. But with the Virgin Mary, her purification will be even greater. Why? Because of her greater vocation. Jeremiah and John had great vocations preparing the people of God remotely and proximately for the coming of the Messiah. Mary's role in the coming of the Messiah 
would be more proximate, more important, more substantial, and she will receive graces in proportion to that vocation. And of course, as we discussed earlier, the reasons the, of, relating to appropriateness as to why Mary would be immaculately conceived from the point of herself and of course being the dwelling house of God. How do we sum this up now by way of conclusion? Why is the Immaculate Conception of Mary something joyful for Christians that we should celebrate this year, every year, if not every day? Well, as I said already, the Immaculate Conception of Mary was God's proximate first step in his plan for the redemption of humanity. We needed the Immaculate Conception so that Jesus would receive a perfect human nature, human nature to be that perfect, spotless, sinless sacrifice on the cross. Without this sinless Redeemer on the cross, we would not be redeemed children of Adam. We would not be restored children of God. We will not be people of, in grace walking towards glory. We will not be able to inherit the heavenly kingdom. How much we should be thankful to God for redeeming humanity and beginning that great work of redemption by creating Mary free from all stain of original sin. How we should be thankful to Mary for her great free yes at the Annunciation, the yes given to the angel Gabriel when he appeared to her and put to her this proposition of being the mother of the, of the Redeemer. When we look at the Immaculate Conception, it's not just something we should be celebrating and joyful about because it relates to the past or even the present, but it's something we should look at with joy with respect to the future. The Immaculate Conception of Mary is a sign of our future hope that if we die in a state of grace, we too, because of the work of Jesus and Mary, will one day live eternally in the heavenly temple, in the heavenly glory, seeing God face to face, free from all stain of sin. Yes, the sinless Jesus and the sinless Mary, their complete work, their cooperation together to redeem humanity will enable us to one day be creatures of God, children of God, sons of, and daughters of God, to be living in the heavenly temple in glory, perfect beings, free from all sin forever and ever. On that joyful note, I will say, Amen. God bless and thank you.